Hello Year 10s and welcome to your taster lesson. We would be doing this slightly different under normal circumstances but here we are. Um, hopefully you find this interesting, hopefully you find it um, informative so you know what you'll be getting in Year 12 and 13. So let's start. Okay. Sociology A level. Your exam exam board will be a QA. You will be doing an A level course. We don't offer AS levels as far as I'm concerned. Um, you're doing now. Just as a quick starter, what has this pig got to do with sociology? Pause your uh, pause your YouTube video for now, please. Okay, so. This is Joanne Lefson. She is from South Africa and she has decided to save this pig from the slaughterhouse. In terms of a community, in terms of a, a collectivist or individualistic country, um, what do we know about South Africa, especially when it comes to poverty, crime? Could she have saved somebody else? Could she have... Uh, saved a young child uh, in terms of education, so paid for their education. Could she have saved another animal maybe, for example? Um, as a sociologist, we do look into different culture, countries, different cultures, and within it, different values. Okay, For her, saving this pig was very important, um, and eventually taught the pig different, tried to teach the pig different types of skills and uh, the, now the, pa the pig paints and she sells uh, the pig's paintings um, to then provide money or charitable uh, money to, to, to give to charity for um, other pigs in slaughterhouses, okay? I know it's really, really random but we do look into the weird and wonderful in sociology and everything is a part of society. And therefore, we will look at everything um, if we have to. So, in terms of your A level sociology, now I've put up AS there um, just because it is offered, but that's not what we offer. So, your AS sociology would be paper one and paper two, but we do not offer that um, because actually, when you if you want to get to university level or if you need UCAS, when you do need UCAS points uh, to to go into an apprenticeship, for example. Your, an A level holds more weight than an AS level, so we will be encouraging you to do a uh, A level sociology. You'll do paper one, two, and three. Paper one would be uh, I will teach you for the first uh, couple of ter terms uh, education with theory and methods, and you will also learn families and households as an option. Okay. Um, you will also do beliefs in society because that's what we offer um, and in your second year you will do crime and deviance with theory and methods and also um, that would be your beliefs in society okay e each of your assessments are worth 80 marks um, well they are 80 marks and they're worth 33.3 recurring um, percent of your complete a level okay uh, you have per mark, you will have a minute and a half to complete each um, question, if that makes sense. So if you have um, a six marker, you will have nine minutes on average to, to do that question. So it's actually quite good timing. Um, now, we where, it, where we have to decode exam questions, so these are your codes. If we were to decode it, this is exactly what we expect you to be able to do, okay? So where it says identify, we literally want you to be able to name something. If I say identify uh, the comprehensive curriculum, for example, you should be able to know exactly what that is. That is your AO1. If then I ask you to apply something, that's your applying your knowledge to a real life scenario or a study. That's your AO2. All of your exam papers and your exam questions will either be marked with AO1, AO2 or AO3. For those of you who do sociology already know this. And this is the way we, we try to teach you. So that by the time you come to year 12, you know exactly what your AO um, 
stands for. Um, so your AO is your assessment objective, okay? So what are your AOs? So have a read uh, of these two pages. So pause your video for me, please. Okay, so to start, uh, just a quick activity. Hopefully you haven't done this with any other college. Um, the lifeboat game, okay? A passenger liner is bricked at sea and 15 people find themselves together in a lifeboat. The lifeboat, however, can only support nine people. If six are not eliminated, everyone will die. If you were in command of the boat, whom would you choose to survive? Discuss, obviously you can't discuss in pairs, but um, discuss with anyone you have at home and be, be, be prepared to justify your answers, okay? So this is more of a philosophical question than anything else. Pause this video for me, please. So, a passenger liner is wrecked at sea and the... Uh, and these 15 people find themselves together in a lifeboat. The lifeboat, however, can only support nine people of six. Uh, if six are not eliminated, everyone will die. If you were in command of the lifeboat, whom would you choose to survive? So you are required to reach a joint decision as to which passengers will be eliminated. So make sure you are doing this with a family member or a, or, or a friend. Um, so you've got one to 13 different types of people different types of jobs and skills. I want you to have a look and I want you to really sieve out the six you do not want, the six that you think may not necessarily be needed uh, if you were to be saved or if you were to end up on a island, for example, okay? Pause this video for me. So if you were going to create a perfect society, what would it look like? Now, this is C. Wright Mills. Um, and C. Wright Mills actually came up with the term sociological imagination. It, in its simplest form means uh, the ability to see the relationship between individual experiences and the larger society. I, I am preparing a PowerPoint for you guys to explore the sociological imagination in a lot more detail with, lo with loads of examples that I can give you. But when we talk about the sociological imagination, you have to be able to, to, to be almost empathetic for you to be able to speak from different perspectives. Regardless of how much you disagree with the perspective, you need to be able to write uh, as if you were one, okay? So a society is a large social grouping that shares the same geographical territory and is subject to the same political authority, authority and cultural expectations, okay? This is a culture, this is a society, sorry, okay? Human beings are social animals, we all live and participate in society. We don't just hunt and eat and do the same thing the next day and the next day. We are social beings, that's why we have cinemas that's why we learn to socialize and 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 say please and thank you and request things and need things or think we need it when in fact we want it okay like for example having a phone what were people doing before we had phones that we can put in our pocket and and walk out with how were people communicating why do we need whatsapp do we need whatsapp do we need to take pictures and look over our pictures or send them to people okay Oh. So, what is society made of? When we look at social institutions, these are the things put in place within our society that helps lead us um, to, to become who we are, okay? So the family is usually where we will all start. You are born into a family, okay? That family teaches you the norms and values of society, okay? Um, we then move on to the education system. So then whatever you learn in the family, you, it is then reinforced in the education system, okay? Um, we would have probably some religious instruction from either our society or from our, our family. And this will also help uh, enforce uh, the political system. So for example, we're, we're not in a secular country, we're in a religious country, and our religion is the Church of England, for example. So a lot of our policies and po political system is made up of 
um, of laws and rules uh, that's helped us uh, from the Bible. Okay. Um, now this all contributes to the economy. Obviously, we are in a capitalist system. So how does that make us uh, believe what we do in the family. For example, um, if you were, for example, um, in America, you have the American dream. So you work hard, you're, you're going to achieve the Amer American dream. Okay. Society can be seen as the sum of its social institutions, which all interlink and work together and influence our culture. If you do sociology, you already know as a functionalist, this is where we talk about organic analogy. So as if society was, uh, as if society is um, organs and every single organ works um, works together to make the whole human being uh, survive and work and live and be happy and harmonious, okay? So examples of relationship between individuals and society, okay? Which groups are most likely to follow a religion? A religion sorry. Does violence in the media encourage violence in real life? Have we heard of uh, violent teenagers um, acting a certain way and we then turn around as adults and blame violent video games? Uh, does the culture a child belongs to influence their achievement at school? Do we all believe this stereotype that every Chinese uh, child is, is, is extremely smart and every black boy for example is extremely disruptive or are they stereotypes that have been put onto a culture um when in fact we know that black boys for example leave with the highest grades from primary school so what happens between primary school and year seven where we have a decline um in black boys educational achievement and a lot of us for a lot of us who have done social uh, sociology in year 10 um know that actually labelling and internal and external factors have a big uh, say in this. Um, who is more likely to commit a crime? We already know that men are punished more harshly and are probably going to be um, going to have some sort of consequence whereas uh, in terms of uh, the chivalry thesis well, women get, get away with it a lot more. Oh, I'm I'm sorry, officer. I didn't realise I was going so fast. I'm in a rush. I'm trying to get home to to my child uh, to tuck them into bed or something. So all these excuses. Do we allow women a lot more? So can you think of any research areas that sociologists might be interested in, which indicates the relationship between groups of people and societal trends? Okay. So can you think of any more that I haven't put up here? Um, discuss with a family member or a friend. Pause this video, have a chat. So, how do sociologists work? Divorce is now a reasonable, reasonably common feature of society and uh, within the last couple of days actually, I've seen that, um, I think it grounds, grounds two or something like that, you can now get divorced without having uh, to blame each other, without having to blame somebody for the end of the relationship where in fact, we didn't have that before, and even before that, um, up until up until the late eighties, early nineties, we we couldn't even divorce as easily, and even before that, only men could divorce women. Women couldn't divorce their husbands. So with with time, we can see society is changing. Okay, can you think of any research areas that sociologists might be interested in? which indicates the relationship between groups of people and societal tre trends. Have a look at what's going around, uh, what's going on around the world right now for you to be able to see trends that are enforcing policy changes. Okay. So if you have a look at this, Divorce in England and Wales, you can see from 1857 to 1997, the dramatic increase in divorce. Now, usually when I ask this question, I say, oh, is divorce a good thing? Usually, I always have a more negative answer than I do a positive. Oh, no, we people shouldn't be getting divorced because what about the children? Or, you know, it's breaking up a family and etc, etc. 
then when we delve deeper into it, we realise that actually a lot of adults who, who had parents who stayed together and they should have divorced, preferred their, their parents, would have rather their parents divorced because of the trauma they had to live through because their parents didn't divorce and they, they, the, the constant arguments and the negative atmosphere they had to grow up in. And um, some uh, some children went through domestic violence or watched their mother go through or, uh, or father go through domestic violence. So actually, divorce isn't necessarily a negative thing, but it all depends on where your values come from, where your values stand. So why do you think the divorce rate has uh, risen? Think about society. Is this about individual reasons or are there bigger reasons imposed upon uh, couples by society? So once you've come up with a reason, see if you can work out how sociologists might investigate that reason. This is where your research methods, your 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 research methods come in. Okay, remember sociology is evidence based, not just sociologists' opinions. We do not stereotype in uh, sociology. Sociologists are not allowed to stereotype because then it doesn't become it, it isn't sociologist. It isn't sociological. Okay. Pause the video so you can write those down. <laughs> right, culture. So not all societies have the same culture. This is cultural diversity. For example, the UK has very different ways of doing things to China. We know China is a collectivist country. We also know by name it is a communist country. Okay. China also has a one country, two systems um, uh, leadership going on with Hong Kong, for example, and it's not really working. So we are slightly different, but well not slightly, we're quite different, but in which ways? Because it's not just politics that are different uh, with China, we have other cultural uh, differences. So culture is all of th those things that are learned and shaped by society or group of people and transmitted from generation to generation. It includes all those things that society thinks is important. Can you give me any examples? However, all cultures share some basic ideas, so language, family, religion, property, called cultural universals. So, for example, as a cultural universal, we in, in the UK, um, we need to be tolerant of each other's beliefs. I might be Christian, you might be atheist, but I ha we have to tolerate each other's beliefs and not try to, to make each other feel any which way or force each other to, to, to change our beliefs because that we don't agree with that. We have religious freedom in our country. Not every country is like that. Some people may judge another culture as it is very different to their own, the acceptance that there are differences but that every culture should be treated with equal respect is called cultural relativism. Have you ever been in the common room, for example, or um, been in an environment where somebody from a different culture is eating uh, their lunch, let's say, or their dinner, for example, and it smells quite different to what you have. So, for example, if you have a Sunday roast, um, it smells quite different to a, a I don't know, a Tom Yum uh, soup, for example, which is Thai. It's going to smell different. But do we make comments? Have we heard comments that, oh, that stinks, or... Um, oh, that smells weird, and it will be used in a negative way, because then we're not treating each other with equal respect. Members of society also share norms and values. Can you define these? What's a norm and what's a value? Because a, a, a norm isn't necessarily what you value. A norm is something you do. So, for example, I need to come to work um, dressed a certain way, but that might not necessarily be my value. Maybe outside of work, I don't wear suits. Maybe outside of uh, outside of work, I wear track suits all day, all day, every day. Okay. So social life is full of rules. Your norms are the unspoken and unwritten rules of behaviour in everyday life. This is your your norms and values you usually learn in uh, in your primary socialisation at home. Your values are the beliefs that we all share that form the basis for our norms. Okay, your role, the norms that go with our status, and your status, the position that a person has in our society. Your role and your status, we see this in school all the time. 
your role is to be a student, therefore you must listen to the person with the status, the person in, in authority, which will be your teachers, okay? And even in terms of status, you have status within school. We have our head teacher, we have our uh, deputy head teachers, our assistant head teachers, our head of faculties, our head of departments, our teachers, and etc. 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 Okay? Now we've got two different types of statuses: ascribed status and achieved status. Ascribed status is a status you are given, you're born into. A given example of a status that you could possibly be born into. Give a, st uh, give a status that um, you have achieved yourself. You've put in the effort, you've put, into work, in, you've put in the work, and you now are in a, in, in a certain position because of your achieved status. So two examples for me, please. Pause this video. Welcome back. Um, I would say, for ascribed status, easy. We have the queen. We have the queen and anybody else who was born uh, in that bloodline will have uh, ascribed status, okay? No matter how good or no matter how bad they might be, they still have ascribed status. They will always have that status, okay? Uh, your achieved status could be a sort Sir Alan Sugar, for example. He wasn't born into his status. He's worked his way to where he, he is now. Jay-Z, for example, Kanye West. So what might happen if an, if an individual fails to keep to a societal norm? How would society react? Okay, now sanctions is very important because we do this to you in school. If you come to school late, what do we do? If you don't listen to a teacher, what happens to you? So, Poor table manners whilst eating, a per uh, while, whilst eating a person talks and spits food in, uh, onto others. Theft of a mobile phone from a friend. Committing polygamy, so having uh, have married more than one partner at the same time. Um, whilst on holiday, a person has eaten dog meat, for example. Um, now that, for example, guys, that's completely normal in certain countries, okay? And I don't want anyone to automatically, stereotypically, think of a country. All I want you to do is think, why? Why is dog meat not accepted in our country? Because technically, dogs are not human, and dogs are not domesticated animals unless you domesticate them. So within our country, for example, and, and most Western countries, well, dogs are domestic animals. We treat them as if they're family. But in, uh, you know, other countries around the world, they don't understand why you are friends with a dog. It makes no sense to them because it's an animal. And just like you will eat a chicken or a pig, you will eat a dog. Okay. So anyway, uh, whilst living abroad in another country, a person has been a cannibal. So cultural attitudes to food items. Have a look at this. Okay. Cultures and their norms can vary greatly. What one considers normal, another considers deviant. Okay. What is your attitude towards cannibalism? How does our society view it? And I want you to find some sort of evidence for me. So if you just turn around as a sociologist, you cannot say, oh, it's disgusting. Or, oh, um, you know, why would you do that? And almost not have anything to say because it's not normal. That's not the normal thing to do. And, and we, but actually, we also know that it is illegal. And that would be your one of your evidences, for example. Okay, so I want you to have a look at this video. A few months ago, we took you back to the Stone Age to meet the last of the cannibals, a tribe called the Korowai, who live in the jungles of West Papua, just as they did 10,000 years ago. They still believe in witchcraft, they still eat human flesh. It was an amazing experience for reporter Ben Fordham. So too was finding a frightened child named Wawa. 
just a boy, but the Korowai are convinced he's possessed by evil spirits. For this, tribal law says he can be killed and eaten. No doubt you've heard quite a bit about Wawa in the last week. Now's the time to go back into the jungle for the truth. I went there ten years ago, and because it was so dangerous, I only got to the edge of the territory. This time, I want to go deep into Korowai territory. Yeah, Manatropo. Paul Raphael is a man with a passion for lost tribes and black magic. And here's a spear that went there. He's a writer for the respected Smithsonian Museum. I'm looking for physical evidence of the cannibalism. I want to try and find the bones, the evidence that they actually do eat people. West Papua, just a few hundred kilometres north of Australia, but it could be a different planet. Snow-capped mountain ranges rich in gold and copper. And for its Indonesian rulers, the greatest prize of all, timber. Down there is the largest expanse of rainforest outside the Amazon. And that's where we're going. We've arrived at the edge of Korowai Territory, the start of a 10-day round trip into the jungle. We've hired 15 Korowai porters to help carry our equipment. Just really quickly, what I want to do is, even though we know this is a society completely different to ours, why have they clothes on? I don't understand how they can possibly even think about putting clothes on or or hiding some sort of uh, modesty or so obviously the outside world has made contact with them and clothed them this is what we do because we we as the western society believe that we need to civilize uh, tribes and civilize um, different groups of people therefore one of the ways we do this is by showing them and giving them clothes okay as for the rest of our expedition, there's me, a ring-in reporter for 60 Minutes, thrown in the deep end. And 10-year-old Tony, a Korowai kid who heard we were coming and walked half a day to watch the plane land. Now he's decided he's coming along, whether we like it or not. And so begins a gruelling trek into the thickest, wettest, muddiest jungle on the planet. Billy, is that one of them making a bridge? <laughs> and our porters are Korowai. And some of them are even cannibals. We have some people who have actually eaten human flesh as our porters, yes. But they enjoy the taste. They say it's pretty good. Day two of our journey. And we're already among people who have turned their back against the outside world. That stone axe epitomises, sums up a whole epoch of humankind, millions and millions of years, when people use stone axes. Now, these are the, one of the last people in the world who are still and truly in the Stone Age. the track has literally come to an end. And the bad news for us is it ain't over. It's a long way from it. We've got two more days worth of travelling and the locals tell us the only way to do it is by water, heading up the river. At times, the river's so shallow... Everyone has to get out and push. Oh, 
As darkness falls, we're still on the river, and our troubles are just beginning. It's an ambush. We've got a frightening situation right here on the water at the moment. There's a tribe that's quite angry, armed with bows and arrows. They've come down to the shoreline and they're asking us to come onto the land. Do the boys think it could be a trap? It's another Korowai clan with a reputation for murder. They want money, the equivalent of about $50, and we're happy to pay. But our oarsmen are too terrified to paddle over. They think it's a trick. Finally, it's our 10-year-old hard man, Tony, who works out a deal. OK, well, I've got the money here. If they want to yeah. Uh, and after a tense few minutes, leaders of the angry tribe arrive by canoe to collect their ransom. We just want to be peaceful, yeah? Yeah. Three fifty. Okay. Three hundred and fifty thousand. Be okay? Mano? Mano. And then they're gone. <laughs> Good negotiating, huh? No, no. Oh, Day five, and we're back in the forest. We come upon a Korowai with an axe made of steel and a heart made of stone. Bai Lum tells us how he killed one of his best friends. It's just normal. I don't feel sad or anything like that. And this is what Korowai cannibalism is all about. When a member of the tribe dies, the Korowai believe that person is a victim of black magic, struck down by some sort of evil spirit known as the Kakwa. What follows is a frightening witch hunt. Someone must be the Kakwa, and once the clan decides who it is, he will be killed and eaten. Remember, these are Stone Age people. They don't understand about microbes and germs and so on. So if someone dies mysteriously, it must have been the sorcerer, the Kakwa. And so that person's relatives go out and grab that person and pretty gruesomely kill him. This man you killed, did you know him before you killed him? Yes, so at one he point, was my friend. At one point, um, he said this man is, um, he has a heart of stone, for example. Well, actually, he doesn't. He doesn't have a heart of stone. Um, and saying somebody is killed gruesomely. Now, all of that is ethnocentric, okay? We're looking at it from a very Western world and a very Western uh, mindset um, because... When we're looking at these people, this tribe, for them, it's not gruesome. For them, it's not uh, being heartless or having a heart of stone to, to do what they're doing. Clearly, for them, it is their way of life, their their norms and their, their traditions um, for them to do what they're doing. Okay? So, please keep that in mind. And he was part of my family. That night, Bai Lum arrives at our camp. He's carrying a black bag. Oh, God. What do you think of that? This is a, a man who was eaten by other humans, in fact, by the man who's sitting next to us. Take a look at that. Well, Bailum has come good on his promise. He's come to our village and shown us his greatest trophy, the skull of a human being. Twelve months ago, Bailum's cousin died, but just before he died, he told him that this man, Buna, was a sorcerer, a witch man. So he saw it as his duty to track him down and to kill him, to kill the Kakwa. <laughs> First we cut off the head and then we start to slice open the stomach. 
We take out the intestines and then cut the ribs out of the side. Then we cut off arms and legs. They eat everything except the teeth, the hair, and the nails. Everything. It's now day seven. We're in completely unknown territory. We stumble upon a hunting party of Korowai men who insist we come to their village. You can go up? Yeah, yeah. They look, they look friendly, huh? Looking around these astonished faces, it's clear they've never seen anything like us. Have you ever seen white people before, like, like us, with white skin? No, I've never seen the white people before. When we heard you were coming, I was thinking you were a ghost. The people were afraid, but when I met you, you are a human. The quest of a lifetime, and I finally done it. I finally made that first contact. First contact with, with, with a clan that hasn't changed for 10,000 years. You know, we could be in a time machine. You know those science fiction movies? You get in the machine, you press 10,000 years, press a button, zap! One moment later, you open the door, and here we are in a cannibal tribe in remote New Guinea 10,000 years ago. Imagine the enormity of that, huh? And I ask that question because it's important. There have been times where we've made contact with these tribes and actually took diseases over by, you know, by accident or, or whatever um, and ended up killing off whole tribes um, because we've made contact with them. And obviously we don't, they don't have the same medicine we have. Um, and therefore we've actually taken viruses and uh, diseases to them. Um, do you think it's ethical? Do you think we need to, um, to, to change maybe their, their way of life? Um, yeah, think about it. That's the moment we've got now. That's why I've got tears in my eyes. I'm sorry. Must look like a whipper. Hey, don't pull me pants down. <laughs> This was an unforgettable encounter. For us, a taste of what life was like at the dawn of humankind. She's holding on for dear life. For them, a visit from the future. They're as fascinated by us as we are by them. <laughs> It's so hard to comprehend because these people are so generous, so open, so childlike in their innocence, yet they can turn so suddenly on their uncle, their brother, their father, anyone who they believe is evil, is a kakwa. And in a split second, they can kill them and then eat them. And then, the most chilling moment of our journey. We find a little boy looking scared and confused. Wawa is six years old and he's been condemned to death. All because his mum and dad died suddenly. And the people in his village think that he is a sorcerer, he's evil. Uh, yeah, they're suspicious. So I starting, they're suspicious that uh, this kid's uh, become as a sorcerer. But Wawa's family and friends are determined to protect him. He's been brought here to safety to this village, a long way from the Kakwa killers. And our guide Cornelius has taken him under his wing. How old do 
the villagers wait until they would kill this boy. It would be like between starting from 15 years old, 16 years old. So at least he's safe for now. The villagers assured us this was the best place for him. That Wawa would never be able to cope if he was suddenly taken out of the Stone Age and dropped into the 21st century. When he's a bit older, he can decide for himself whether to leave his people. I think as long as that he's staying with the family, as who the family is strong enough to protect him, he will be safe, I think. It wasn't easy saying goodbye to Wawa. But then who are we to impose our ways, our ideas of what's right and what's wrong on the ancient Korowai? What about this poor little boy, Wawa? He's being protected in this village here, Yafufla, by a powerful section of his family. <coughs> this is the toughest question I've ever faced and I've been thinking about it for many years. I mean, what do we do? OK, we don't understand that they kill and eat each other, but to them that's very important at the very soul of their being. So my feeling, my desperate feeling, is that just let them be as they are because within 20 or 30 years it'll be all over anyway. And just to let you know, we managed to get through to Cornelius this weekend. OK. So, what is your attitude, attitude towards cannibalism? How does your society view it? Have you got evidence for it? How is this different to them what we just watched? How is their culture different? Has your ideas or your beliefs shifted? Do you, do you now think actually... It really does depend which culture, which country, which uh, norms and values you, you come from, or, or are all these people evil? Tell me what you think, okay? So make sure you're, you're writing this down, please. Pause the video if you have to. So, cultural attitudes. In some cultures and in some circumstances, cannibalism is a cultural norm, okay? So the Korowai people of Papua New Guinea practice it. Okay, what I want you to do is go back onto the, I think it was the second PowerPoint, where we've got the AOs and their identification, okay? So, identify and explain their cultural re reasons for cannibalism. Is it justified? Is it functional? Then I want you to write a summary of how the meaning of cannibalism varies between and within cultures. So what you did here, okay, should help, your ideas here should help with this. Okay, make sure you have a look, have a look back up here. Okay, have a look back here and see what identify means. Okay, uh, see what identify and outline or, or analyze is. Okay, now when you are doing your AO3s, they tend to be um, some of the most difficult skills to learn. But as a sociologist, you're going to learn it very quickly. I'd be very surprised if you don't catch it very quickly because I'm going to constantly, within lessons, ask you questions where you're going to have to explain yourself, where you're going to have to evaluate um, information I've given you or information you've given me. You, got, you, you need to uh, analyse what other sociologists and per uh, perspectives think um, and then you'll, you'll give me a balance, okay? So you'll be assessing constantly. Um, oh. Okay, so do this for me now and pause the video. So, Eurocentrism, okay? We should take care not to assume that Western cultural norms and values are superior to any other cultures. So, for example, when I, get, when I said uh, earlier about how if you were having a, um, a tom yum soup, for example, and it smells weird or it smells disgusting or those kind of even those thoughts forget comments but even those thoughts um are very in 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 a way very um arrogant because you feel as though it is something weird it is something that smell is out of the ordinary as if your way of life and your food um is the normal way is how everybody should be uh, eating and what everyone should be smelling for example 
So when considering the diversity of the world's peoples, it is important that we do not refer to Western norms and values as the template to which we compare all others. So for example, we eat fish and chips on a Friday. Well, why do we do that? Fish Friday. Christianity. So we start to really think about, oh, why are we doing these kind of things? Why do we eat fish on a Friday um, and not, for example, uh, roast dinner on a Friday? Okay. Um, so what impact might cultural differences have? So write down the positive and negative consequences of what the impact might be on cultural differences. So for example, when we had a look at the Korai people, the researchers described their behavior in certain ways. Remember I said to you, be careful and listen to their language. Because when they put certain certain descriptive words in front of, um, you know, other words to describe these people, it wasn't in a very positive uh, light. Not that they need to put it in a positive light, but it needs to be facts. And the fact is, when you say something is gruesome, you are telling me what you think. When you tell when you when you're telling me that somebody has a heart of a, a stone for a heart, you're telling me that they're, they're they're somebody they are somebody who is bad. They are doing bad things. You're not talking to me. You're not giving me this information objectively. And as sociologists, you have no choice. You have to be objective, okay? And we will have a look at um, some studies where because it doesn't uh, have objectivity. It isn't the best example to be to, to use. We can always evaluate it, and it will always become uh, a weakness within the study because it because of its subjectivity. Okay, do this for me now, please. Pause your video. So norms and values can change over time. Can you think of any? Again, I keep on talking to you, and I keep I will forever tell you. Think about what's happening now. Look at the social world around you. Look at the world around you. See what kind of uh, policies are changing. Okay, we have at the at this precise moment an uprising, and it, and it is an uprising because actually policies are being changed. The uh, those people in in the most amount of power right now are showing that they also believe in what the people believe in, or what majority or a minority uh, of the people believe in. Okay, policies are changing. Can you tell me some of which, uh, some of whom are? I've given you a divorce one already this week. Um, another one for family, for example, paternity leave. Is it fair that maternity leave goes on for about a year and paternity leave at this current climate is two weeks? It sh it's been extended to six months. Why are we not equal when it comes to that? So, sorry this has been cut off at the top. There have been a number of legal changes relating to gay and bisexual people, for example. So attitudes uh, to homosexuality are a good example of changing norms. Okay. There are so many uh, reports and laws and policies that are changing. Um, the Equal Opportunities Act, for example, laws for gay marriages or civil partnerships. So many things are changing within our society. That I want you to be able to, to have a look. You need to be uh, in constant, um, what's the word? You need to constantly be keeping up with current affairs for you to be able to do this, okay? So, from uh, 1290 to 2010, look at all the changes that have been made legally, can I just say, for gay and bisexual people. Have you ever been in school and a teacher's made a remark, um, a negative remark about gay or bisexual people? Well, that now is le illegal, guys. Okay? So, take notes, have a look at this. You can um, even make a timeline if you want to, it's up to you. But what I do want you to understand is there is there has been a dramatic change from, from the start to the very end, there's been a dramatic change, okay? 
I mean, for example, we don't necessarily um, need, uh, I don't necessarily need you to know that in 97, uh, Labour MP Angela Eagle was the first British MP to come out as a lesbian. I don't need you to, to, to remember that, but I do want it to, to have an effect on you. I do want you to think to yourself, wow, that people have been gay or bisexual from the start of time, let's say, and in 1997, in a Western country, in a modern country, in a democratic country, we, we didn't have anybody in our political um, parties or in the government who came out as gay or bisexual. Why haven't they, why hadn't they come out as gay or bisexual? Why is it such a big deal for for footballers or or, or rug, rugby players, for example, to come out as as gay or homosexual people? What kind of backlash um, do you think they they are getting? Okay. Now, attitudes to homosexuality are a good example of changing norms. Okay, so when do you think attitudes began began to actually change? Okay, and that's important. So you've got we've got your AO2, your AO, AO1, AO2, and AO3 there. Answer these questions for me, please. Okay, I'm going to put on Lord Humphreys' research um, in a second. Make sure you've got this these questions to answer. Okay, and also I'm going to show you your the pervert chart. I know it sounds weird, um, but it is used by so many schools across the country. Um, it's a good way to remember your research methods okay so this is a study pause it for me please this is your evaluation so in terms of lord humphrey's um study have a look at practical uh, the, the the practicality of the study okay how much time was uh, did he uh, spend on this study? How much money did it cost him? Was it a longitudinal study, for example? Because if it is a longitudinal study, you can see change in attitudes from for a very long time, which is a lot more valuable um, than you know conducting this study for a year or two, um, because society doesn't change that quickly, especially when it doesn't want to. Okay. Um, so practical, ethical, is it reliable? Is it valid? Remember, there's a difference between reliable and validity, okay? Reliable is if you were to, to replicate, if you were to do this study again, are you going to get the same results? Because if you are, it is reliable, okay? What, what is the evidence? Representativeness, okay? So for example, has he used any, uh, any black or uh, ethnic minorities in his research? So can it be representative? representative? Okay, um, and theoretical. So is it a positivist or an interpretivist point of view, girls and boys? Okay, uh, pause this and answer those questions for me, please. So your norms and values, okay? Once this is established, okay, how are these norms maintained? As new generations are born and raised, how do they become familiar or internalise the expectations related to that uh, behaviour and beliefs? So, for example, uh, let's say I am a Buddhist and I lead my life in a Buddhist uh, way. So, um, I don't have too many luxuries in my home. I meditate uh, often. I try to constantly have uh, teach my child and live my life uh, through the middle way so I don't I don't overindulge and I don't underindulge and, um, and this is how I, I bring my child up is my child going to internalize and take on a lot of the norms and values that I teach it before it goes to before he or she sorry goes to secondary school okay and are those values are those norms and values then reinforced in secondary school because if it's not, I might want to move. I might want to move to a country where it is, where it is a Buddhist, Buddhist country, where the laws and the policies and the way they will uh, be socialized in uh, school is going to be the same, okay? So crucially, might it be the case that these norms reflect not simply the interests of us all, but the interests of specific and dominant social groups? So if you remember, or if you do know anything about um, Karl Marx and, and, and his 
uh, his theory of the class system, so the proletariats against, against the bourgeoisie, well, you'll understand that the dominant class is the bourgeoisie. And everything that they believe, all of the norms and values, they want you to believe and internalise and you live your life by, is trickled down the, the many different institutions within our society for us to live that way. So, through our culture and through all of these social institutions, okay? You've got to remember that the economy pretty much is handled by the bourgeoisie uh, from a Marxist uh, perspective, okay? The education system, the family, religious instruction, the political system, they are all in the interests of our uh, the most powerful people in in our country so when it comes to when it comes to the political system for example well, we have a lot of mps and mps families who avoid tax who have avoided tax and got away with it that's forgery that's pretty much stealing if you think about it but if i was to go to sainsbury's and steal an item i'll have a criminal record wouldn't i if i was to 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 do, do that quite a few times I'd probably end up in prison in some sort of for some however long or I'll have to do some community service but there will be sanctions there will be consequences to my actions even though what I would have done is so minuscule so small in comparison to avoiding tax and so we have our Marxists who believe that actually where this is such an unequal society that the bourgeoisie pretty much do and get away with whatever they want to because it's their ideologies that is trickled down to us. We don't question the bourgeoisie because we think they're in power for, for a reason. They must be, okay? We speak differently to the bourgeoisie. Look at the way um, Boris Johnson, Johnson speaks, for example. He almost waffles. He can say a lot, but a lot of nothing. And we would be none the wiser because actually... A lot of us, in comparison to Boris Johnson, especially the, the proletariat, have restricted codes. So that's your Bernstein's um, restric restricted codes, for example. Okay, He speaks uh, with elaborated codes, which is exactly the language that's taught to you in school. Okay, Telling you to analyse and assess and, and to use your sociological imagination, for example. All of those words, well actually, how often do you use that at home? Is that how your parents speak to you? Do they tell you to justify your answer or do they say why? Yeah? Okay. Um, oh, where are we? Ah. Yes, so please do answer this for me and pause this uh, video and then resume. So, your key terms. I want you to find these out and I want you to send them to me, please. The concepts are... So things that we, we will definitely look at and use, um, and it will become a part of our vocabulary, society, culture, cultural diversity, cultural universal, um, cultural relativism, norms, values, roles, status, Eurocentrism, uh, uh, ethnocentrism, uh, the hidden curriculum, uh, elaborated and restricted cults, internal and external factors. All of these words we will be using in our vocabulary as if it is something that you have grown up with because as sociologists you need to know what these are as sociologists you need to understand that they are and could be causes for for why we have turned out the way we have okay so just handy things for you guys to have these are just a few for you to have or do okay um this is a, a book I found useful. I've got other books that are quite useful as well that I could, I'm happy to share with you. Um, there are magazines out there, there are publications, there's Jestor, for example, which is great for academic reading. Um, but any background reading from Rob Webb textbooks, for example, get used to reading Philip Allen Hodder article, articles, join the sociology and psychology um, uh, website, uh, sorry, uh, Instagram page, for example. Um, Truth to You website is quite good because it actually goes through exam questions and how to answer them. Um, 
follow sociology websites on Twitter, for example, sites on Twitter. Um, you need folder dividers. If you have a look at this, this is what we'll be um, using as our textbook. It is so student friendly, user friendly, it's absolutely perfect for you. Um, so yeah, we've got this and we've got, um, I've got a book where it just has exam questions. Um, just so you know what will probably be coming up, not only in your lessons, but also in um, in your exams. Um, it is a written exam, please remember that. Um, I don't know, what else? Yeah? Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. If you need anything, let me know. I hope there wasn't anything too sensitive uh, in terms of the video and cannibalism or any of the things that we'll study. Um, a lot of you who will be coming to sixth form have already done sociology, which I'm really excited about because I can't wait to either teach you again or teach you from, I know I've, I've taught some of you from year nine, um, which was great and I do, I have missed you, so that would be great. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions, let me know. I've got loads of things that I can I can send to you, so certain websites, for example, or books that you could be reading, having a look at. Um, a lot of books, if you go on Amazon, if I give you a book, uh, if you go on Amazon, it will let you preview a few of the pages and see if you like um, the way it's written or the way it's structured. Um, yeah, and give me uh, a shout if you need anything. <laughs>